lecture 12, electromagnetic waves in bounded regions. So up to this point, uh, what we learned was the electromagnetic waves in a homogeneous material. Like it can be dielectric or it can have loss. But anyway, the material itself is homogeneous. There's no boundary between the material. And uh, in this lecture, what we are going to learn is the situation when we have a boundary between two materials and then how the light behaves at the boundary. And what we know is, uh, already know is that, let's say we have a material one, material two, then, uh, and then if, if the light coming in, we know that some portion of light is reflected and some, some portion of light is transmitted, right? That's what we know already, like just from uh, daily observation. And then, and then let's say this is incident light, right? This is what we, uh, what we know. And then also uh, if uh, we shine light with some angle, which is called uh, oblique incidence, this is called normal instance, normal. This is a normal to the surface. And then this is oblique instance, oblique incidence. And here in this case too, uh, we can calculate uh, how much is gonna reflect it, how much is gonna refract it, or like uh, transmit it. And then we know that the angle, the incidence angle, and the transmitted angle are different, right? We know this because it's Snell's law. Everyone knows the Snell's law, right? N1 sine theta one is N2 sine theta two, right? Probably everyone knows this. And then, uh, so what we are gonna do is we uh, revisit this known phenomena uh, using a more rigorous theoretical tools like Maxwell's equations, okay? And uh, calculate uh, uh, the amount of reflection and transmission and the angles quantitatively from the Maxwell's equations and boundary conditions. Okay, so let's see how can we do it. So um, as always, uh, I want to begin with easy case and then move on to the more and more difficult uh, situations. So as an easiest uh, case, we deal with normal instance of plane wave. So then we can write three uh, waves. The first one is the incident wave. And then, uh, the second one is a reflected wave, as I said, and the third one is transmitted wave. And the medium one and medium two are defined by uh, its sigma, epsilon, and mu, right? And then here too, sigma, epsilon, and mu. And then subscript tells about uh, the, the medium number. Okay, so let's say here, so this is the Z axis the old wave is propagating along Z. And when Z is negative, uh, there are two waves. One is incident wave, and second is the trans uh, reflected wave. And when Z is positive, there is transmitted wave, okay? And then for incidence wave, incident wave, we know the K vector because once we fix the uh, uh, medium property and then fix the frequency, then uh, by this equation, the K vector, wave vector of the wave is fixed, right? The, the, the um, length of the wave vector is fixed by K1. K1 is uh, epsilon mu1. Uh, and then because we call this as an incident wave, its propagation direction is AG, right? That's what we set, like that's the, how the problem is set. Similarly, uh, KR, which is the reflected wave uh, wave vector, have the same amount of K vector uh, magnitude 
but has opposite direction because it's a reflected wave. It's, it's gonna uh, propagate in on the opposite direction. And the third one uh, in this medium, the K vector magnitude is different because it's uh, epsilon two mu two, right? But the direction itself is still AZ because we are talking about the transmitted wave. And then there's nothing coming in from the medium two. So there's no wave component like that. Okay, so KI, KR, KT, we fixed it. And then because uh, KI, KR, KT is fixed, uh, you, can take, uh, you can set the E, e and H, okay? The thing is, uh, as we said earlier, uh, if the K vector direction is fixed to Z direction, I mean Z, Z axis, E and H needs to be mutually perpendicular, but uh, E can have X and Y, both X and Y component, it doesn't matter, right? So here, what we do is we fix E direction along X direction, okay? And then we can do this without losing generality because, uh, you know, anyway, the electric, electromagnetic wave, electromagnetic wave should have E field and H field. And then we set the coordinate system aligned to the E field direction, right? Then this is X direction. So E, is assumed to uh, have X component only. And here too, X components, X component. Okay. Then uh, with some, some coefficient like amplitude, which is not determined yet, uh, but E to the minus J K one Z part is fixed. And here too, E to the plus J K one Z is fixed with some unknown, undetermined uh, amplitude, electric field amplitude. And then here too, electric field amplitude times e to the minus j k 2 z, right? So the, the form is fixed. And then once e and k are given, h is automatically determined, right? Because you re remember h is what? A k, cross E divided by eta, right? And then A, K and E is given, then H is given. So here there's no nothing, uh, no new parameter. It's just an all known parameters. So if you look at the problem again, there are not that much of an unknowns. Unknown is only three. Right? E I naught, E R naught, and E T naught. And among this, E I naught is what we determine actually, right? Because it's, it's kind of a, how much of a light intensity we, we shine initially. So what's really unknown is the ratio between these. So what's really unknown is actually E I naught, E R naught, the ratio between E R to the E I and then ratio between ET to the EI, right? Because EI is what is determined by shining uh, part. So uh, normalizing the other two by EI naught, we have only two unknowns, right? And this is called reflection coefficient. And this is called transmission coefficient which is called uh, gamma and tau. So the question is determining gamma and tau. So is there anything unclear uh, up to this point? So what, what I try to explain here is we begin with the system assuming the light is coming in from uh, minus G to plus G direction. And then uh, there's reflected light and transmitted light. And then what we further assumed is that electric field is along X direction. And it, there's no problem doing that because we can just set the X, X uh, axis along the E field. 
right? And then, um, and then uh, what I pointed out is that there are actually only two unknowns, which are gamma and tau, reflection and transmission coefficients, right? So, that, so now the problem is reduced to determine gamma and tau, right? Hope everyone is following. Then how? How to obtain gamma and tau? How? Is there any idea? If you have any idea, please let me know. So we have coming in, going out, and transmitted. We need to know, so this is E I naught, E R naught, E tau naught, E T naught. So E I naught, E R naught, this is gamma. And tau is E T naught, E I naught. How to determine gamma and tau? <coughs> Or if we can do an experiment, do an experiment many times. Yes, well, yeah, that's one way to do it, uh, do an experiment and empirically know the answer. But we actually know, uh, we have all the tools that we can solve this problem. We actually have all the theoretical tools. What is that? So what is the key is the boundary condition, okay? So we have a boundary. And then let's recall what we learned. At the boundary, uh, electric field parallel components need to be continuous, right? And then uh, magnetic field, parallel component can be discontinuous, but only when you have a free current, right? But in this case, we, you don't have any free current. You, you are not like uh, launching any current here. So there's no free current here. So that H parallel also needs to be continuous. This is, these are the boundary conditions that we already know, right? So how can we apply the boundary condition? First, because the boundary is G equals zero. So we plug in Z equals zero in all the equations, okay? So when Z equals zero, if you look at these terms, these terms all become just one, right? And then, on this side, when Z equals smaller than zero, you have two electric field component. One is E I naught, this guy. And then the other is this one, plus E R naught. Because electric field, electromagnetic field uh, can be super superposed. It, the, the total field is just the sum of these two fields. This must be equal to E T naught. Right? These are all like a surface parallel component. So E I naught, E R naught must be equal to E T naught. And similarly, H field is also continuous, which means E I naught divided by eta one minus E R naught divided by eta one is equal to E T naught divided by eta two. Right? And then uh, because we take the ratio uh, of EI naught, ER naught, so let's take the ratio. Then this one term becomes one, this term becomes also one, this term becomes gamma, this term becomes gamma, this term becomes tau, tau. Right? Two equations, two unknowns. So you can solve it. Uh, 
Uh, so Park Jun asks, don't we mean surface normal component, not tangential component? When we say E I not, E R not, E T not. No, because surface is here, right? Surface is X Y surface. And then E fields are all X direction. So it's surface parallel component, right? It's, it's not surface normal, surface normal component it should be uh, the, the Z component of the electric field, right? So two equation, two unknowns, then we can solve it, right? So if you do it, this is it. ER naught is now eta two minus eta one, eta two plus eta one. And ET naught is eta two, eta two divided by eta two plus eta one. So reflection coefficient, transmission coefficients are written as a, uh, you know, as a, as a, uh, in terms of eta one and eta two, right? So here, what we've done is what we uh, derive how the electromagnetic field should behave uh, at the interface from first principle, right? We didn't uh, include any other theory. We only use this electromagnetic theory here. So now uh, reflection and transmission coefficients are like this. And then actual energy relation, the reflectance, and the transmit tons uh, for loss listed dielectric interface is of course the ratio of power, right? Not the electric field intensity. And then power, power ratio is given by uh, the, uh, the pointing vector ratio. And the pointing vector is nothing but H cro uh, e, cross, e cross H. And then here the time, uh, this is the S. So if you calculate this, uh, you realize that the, this ratio is actually uh, turned into the ratio between the electric field and uh, electric field in intensities. So this is actually uh, gamma squared, okay? The amplitude, the intensity of gamma. And then tau is the uh, tau squared but here you have uh, eta one divided by eta two in front. Okay, so eta one, eta two. The reason why you have eta one and eta two here is because uh, in, in this calculation, uh, the H field is actually E cross AK cross E divided by eta. So he, uh, and in that process, it's just eta is came in, right? But anyway, uh, you can easily get the reflect, reflect tons and transmit tons, which is the energy ratio, the power ratio of the incident and reflected and transmitted light. So any questions so far? So the distinction is that uh, gamma and tau are the, uh, the, the ratio of electric fields. Right. Of course, this can be a complex number because electric field amplitude is complex number. But the reflect tons and transmit tons are, are energies, so that uh, they are real number always. And then uh, the reflect tons and transmit tons can be written as a uh, you know this form. Right, so I guess um, you guys all understand what's going on here. Now, uh, if you look at, okay, Lee Sang-woo asks, uh, when it's not ideal, R plus T equals one, uh, what, what do you mean uh, known idea? Like, uh, you know, the, the R plus T uh, is, is always, like if there is a loss at the surface, 
then r plus t can be different from one, right? Because r and t is the power ratio. It can never be larger than one, but uh, it can be smaller than one when there exists a surface loss. Okay, so uh, now uh, the normal, if you look at the situation uh, carefully, uh, but just for a simple example, uh, let's consider this case. We have, okay, Jung Yeon Oh <clears throat> asks why we use absolute value for tau and eta in RT. Oh. Oh, uh, okay, Jung Yeon Oh uh, asks an, a nice question. Actually, this needs to be an absolute value because because if you remember the time, uh, again, gamma can be complex number, okay? Because there are cases that eta and eta one and eta two are, are, uh, are just um, uh, complex numbers, right? Even in that case, R must be real number. So, uh, that's why uh, we have a absolute value here, but more, more rigorously, uh, as the time, time averaged uh, pointing vector is E cross H star divided by two, right? And then let's say E is uh, ER not times something. And then H is becomes AK, cross E R naught and E direction or something. And then if you take the uh, uh, complex conjugate, here only, only in this part, complex conjugate applies, right? So uh, E R naught without complex conjugate, E R naught with complex conjugate, if you multiply them, it becomes a, a absolute number. Right, so the result are the same when eta one, eta two are both real number, but result can be different when eta two and eta one becomes a, a complex. But that's a good question. Yeah, so now uh, we uh, start to talk about a situation when we have a lossless dielectric, eight, so sigma one is zero, and then here, sigma two is infinite. Okay, infinite means perfect conductor. Then uh, if you look at the, uh, you know, the, the, this eta two, eta two is square root of uh, mu two divided by epsilon two. And then epsilon two is composed of uh, just epsilon two and then, and then sigma two divided by omega i, right? Omega j, anyway. So uh, when sigma two is infinitely large, epsilon two becomes also infinite. So eta two becomes zero, right? So, uh, so eta two is zero for perfect conductor. So if you if you plug in eta two becomes zero, then uh, gamma the reflection coefficient becomes negative one, and then tau becomes zero, which means there's no transmission at all, and uh, the reflection coefficient becomes minus one. Okay, so r naught is minus e i naught. And then T naught is just zero. So if you draw that situation, uh, of course, in, in perfect conductor size, there's nothing because E T naught is zero. And then here we have incident wave and transmitted wave. I mean, in, in incident wave and reflected wave. And then here's the incident wave and here's the reflected wave. And uh, they both have the same amplitude because of that. And then the sign is negative. So if you write that, it looks like this, right? Incident, 
reflected. And so if you rewrite this, it's a sine function, simple sine function. So um, e to the, so if you, so this is a, a phasor form. If you make it into an in instantaneous form, you need to take the rear part of this. And this becomes just sine K1Z multiplied by sine omega T. Okay, so what does that mean? That means uh, like this situation. So look at this wave. The blue wave tells you, uh, shows you the incident light. Okay, electric field of the incident light. And then uh, red wave is the electric field of reflected light. And as you can see at the, at the interface, the red and blue have the same amplitude, but opposite direction, right? So they always, the sum of those two always zero, right? And then, uh, as, and then this black one, is the sum of red and blue. And you can see here, this wave doesn't look like it's propagating, right? It just looks like uh, it has a few nodes here, red points that never, never uh, changes as a function of time. And then in between, uh, this wave is just going up and down and up and down. Doesn't look like it's, it's gonna go in somewhere, but it's gonna just go doing up and down. Right? So in that sense, this wave, the sum of reflected and transmitted wave is called standing wave, okay? Because it looks like it's standing. It doesn't, you know, propagating. It looks like it's standing. So it's a standing wave, okay? So we, we describe this situation, like the incident wave and reflected wave forms a standing wave, okay? And then, uh, and then if you uh, look at here, so now uh, when eta one is smaller than eta two, so like uh, maybe maybe this one first, when eta one is larger than eta two, like in in the previous case, previous case eta two was just zero, but like not in that extreme, but eta one is larger than eta two, then gamma is negative, okay? Gamma negative from here, this equation. And that is called phase flip, right? Pi phase flip. Incident wave and reflected wave have different opposite phase at the interface. So they cancel each other out, okay? And in, in this case, uh, gamma one is smaller than eta two, the, uh, uh, the eta one, eta one is smaller than eta two, then gamma is positive. So there's no phase flip, which means the incident wave and reflected wave constructively interfere, right? So in both cases, uh, the maximum occurs at different points because like, this is pretty simple. Uh, thing like if you think about let's say this is your this is your incident light okay and if your uh, if your reflected light have uh, you know uh, negative so the phase flip at the interface then the interface becomes a minimum point, minimum amplitude point, right? And then uh, the minimum ampli point, amplitude point uh, occurs at every pi, every pi. And, and then uh, of course the maximum point occurs at pi over two positions, right? Half integer multiple of pi. And on the other hand, uh, in this case, when eta one is smaller than eta two, then the uh, the boundary becomes the maximum point because the reflected and transmitted uh, reflected and incident wave 
constructively interfere. So, so now then here becomes the maximum and here becomes the minimum, right? So these are the two different cases of uh, 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 forming a standing wave. Well, anyway, but in any case, uh, we call, uh, we can define a standing wave ratio uh, like at the minimum amplitude of electric field to the maximum amplitude of the electric field. And then uh, this can be then determined by this one minus gamma and one plus gamma, right? One is the incident wave, gamma is the reflected wave. So when they are, when they are constructively interfere, this is the maximum electric field. When they are destructively interfere, this becomes the minimum amplitude. And then uh, for perfect conductor, like eta becomes minus one, I'm sorry, uh, gamma becomes minus one, the uh, standing wave ratio becomes infinite. So this is like a perfect standing wave. And then when there's no reflection, say gamma is zero, then the standing wave ratio becomes one. So standing wave ratio becomes one means there's no standing wave. Standing uh, wave ratio of infinite is complete standing wave, okay? This is just a definition. You don't need to, um, try, you don't need to try to memorize anything here. But the, the important thing here is just, um, uh, uh, in this case, two waves tends to form a standing wave. That, that's all I want to say. The incident wave and reflected wave forms a standing wave. And depending on how much is reflected, the standing wave ratio changes, right? That's, that's basically what I want to say. Okay, so before we move on to the oblique incidence, uh, do we have any question? Everything's easy so far, right? So let's move on to a little more challenging uh, problem of oblique incidence, okay? Now uh, the situation is a little different. Incident wave is no longer uh, normal to the surface. It has angle theta i, right? And the uh, uh, reflected one forms uh, another angle theta r, and then transmitted one has theta t, okay? And then we define uh, one term, I mean, a few terms, plane of incidence. Plane of incidence is this. Uh, uh, it, it basically means this screen. So the, it, uh, the plane of incidence is determined by the surface normal vector and the incident k vector. So, the plane, a, a plane that contains both of these is called plane of incidence. In, and in, in our case, it's screen. Our screen is plane of incidence, right? And then uh, here, theta i is called angle of incidence. Theta r is the angle of reflection. Theta t is angle of transmission or angle of refraction. Um, either way is fine. So similarly, uh, what, we, what we can do is this. We know that in medium one, uh, the, the magnitude of the wave vector of Ki and Kr are same as K1, right? Because this is just determined by the, uh, uh, the material properties and the frequency. So once you have the material properties in the frequency, K1 is fixed, right? What we don't know is the angle, but the, the, the amplitude is fixed. And here too, transmitted wave, uh, KT is just K2, right? That's fixed, but we don't know the angle, right? And assuming that uh, we just, uh, even though we don't know the angle, we can still write things like this, no problem doing this, right? 
And similarly, uh, here's the EI naught, ER naught, ET naught, and also uh, H can be evaluated, uh, can be calculated from, from uh, like E and AK, okay? So here uh, we have a few more unknowns. First of all, we don't know, we don't theta i because this is what we, what we assign for the first time. I mean, from the first time, but theta r and theta t are unknowns right now. And then of course, the ratios, e, uh, the ratio between ei naught, er naught, et naught are also unknowns. And more importantly, these ratios are now vectors. So it's not just uh, two unknowns, it's, it's more than two unknowns, right? It's just the ratio of the vectors. It's kind of, uh, uh, you, need, you need to determine um, many things in this case. So how to deal with it? How to deal with this problem? Well, what, we, what I can first say is that um, without determining the relation between electric field amplitudes, we can first determine the relation between theta. Okay, we can first determine relation between theta, but how? Of course, we, we, should, we should apply boundary conditions, right? Boundary conditions are the key, but how a boundary condition gives you the relation between thetas. So you have theta i, theta r, theta t, right? And then uh, because we assume that there's nothing, uh, uh, so, uh, so this is x direction, and then this is y direction, and we assume that there's no y component in this case, okay, because that, that's how we chose the uh, uh, coordinate system, no y component. Then let's first write ki in component wise. So then ki becomes what, k1, uh, uh, K1 sine theta i ax plus K1 cosine theta i az, right? And then KR is like it's going here. So uh, K1 uh, sine theta i a uh, theta r, sorry, a x minus k1 cosine theta r a z, right? And similarly, uh, k t is k2 sine theta t a x plus k2 cosine theta t a z, right? So we know the k vector components. And then let's say we want to satisfy the boundary condition. Well, here again, the boundary is just z equals zero, right? So let's think about, uh, let's say all of this has this form, e to the minus j k x x, plus k y y k z z and then because k y is jet zero anyway so this one is going zero all the time and then at the boundary this is also zero because g is zero at the boundary so at the boundary what is non zero is only this term So at the boundary, uh, let's try to write things at the boundary. Then at the boundary, it's like E I naught vector, E to the minus J K 
i x k k1 sin theta i x right this is the incident wave and then reflected wave is e r not e to the uh, plus, uh, minus j k1 sine theta r x and then uh, the transmitted wave is e t naught e to the j k2 sine theta t x right and at the boundaries uh, we need to satisfy e parallel is continuous and then d normal is continuous regardless of x right it's just a uh, satisfied for all points on the boundary so how can we make that happen because it looks like it's difficult because it, x when you change x even though uh, some condition is satisfied at certain x when x uh, deviates from that value then all these numbers become different so that the boundary condition doesn't you know, satisfied. But there's a one way that make all the boundary conditions are satisfied uh, regardless of X. How? How can we do it? How can we satisfy the boundary conditions regardless of X? Well, the answer is that you can make all these exponential x dependence equal, okay? Then you can just cancel this out in boundary conditions, in, cal in calculating boundary conditions, so that the boundary condition satisfied without, uh, regardless of x. How can we do that? Well, we can make k1 sine theta 1 equal to k1 sine theta r equal to k2 sine theta t, right? So if, what, if, we, if this condition is satisfied, then what's above the exponential is equal so that we can just uh, remove this dependence in the boundary conditions so that we can satisfy the boundary condition regardless of x, right? So now let's look at the first condition. So that's here, that's actually written here. And then uh, I explained up to this point. And from here, what we know is the k, k K1 sine um, K1 sine theta i is equal to K1 sine theta r is equal to K2 sine theta t. So from this, we know that sine theta i is equal to sine theta r. And because theta, theta r uh, range is fixed, so theta r is theta i, right? So the angle of incidence, angle of reflection are same. And from the second equation, K1 sine theta one, K2 sine theta two, and K1 is what we learned like N1 K0. K2 is N2 K0. K0 is the free, free space K vector. So K0, K0 divided, then N1 sine theta one is N2 sine theta two. Right? So again, like in order to satisfy the boundary conditions, 
the surface parallel component of the k vector must be same for all wave, uh, all partial waves. And that forces uh, reflection angle to be same as the incidence angle, and then transmission angle to be to have Snell's law uh, to the uh, reflect uh, the instance angle, right? So we can we can derive these relations from the boundary conditions. Of course, this is not the uh, uh, not the what is the opposite of the necessary condition? Like uh, sufficient. This is not the sufficient condition uh, to satisfy the boundary conditions, but this is necessary to satisfy the boundary condition, right? And then uh, from here too, we also know about the condition for total internal reflection, because when N1 is larger than N2, then, uh, you know, and if N1 is larger than N2, and then sine theta i is like a, a large number, then this, you know, uh, we can we can encounter the situation like uh, sine theta t equals N1 sine theta i and two, and then if this is larger than one, and and this is a uh, uh, close to one, then the entire thing becomes larger than one. Then there's no uh, solution for this equation, right? And in this regime, uh, uh, the total internal reflection happens. So what I mean by total internal reflection is that no light is actually transmitted and only uh, reflected by the surface. And that's called total internal reflection. And you, total internal reflection in Korean is 전반사. 전반사 is the um, total internal reflection. And that's why uh, we can have a uh, sort of a fisheye view. So think about the situation where you have um, your uh, underwater here and then the, due to the Snell's law, the normal incidence becomes uh, have normal uh, transmission. But if you have a different angle, then uh, you have other angle here. And then if you are from this point, uh, uh, this is the reflection, uh, uh, the, the angle. And from then on, uh, what's happening is that like, for instance, you are also looking at uh, the light with this angle, right? Or, or this angle. And these angles are coming from total internal reflection. So these lights are not coming from the outside, but uh, like uh, coming uh, from the total internal reflection. So if you actually uh, uh, looking at the top, looking at the sky, sky from uh, underwater, then what you are seeing is actually a light circle, which is defined by this area. And then outside here, what you are actually looking at is not the outside, it's just the, uh, the light reflected uh, from the surface of water, right? This is called fish eyes view and then even though you have you are looking at a limited area, it contains like all the information outside. Right. So just uh, the the exercise is you can you can just uh, looking at at the home. Now. Um, so I'm not going to solve the actual problem now. Uh, but let's just uh, uh, introduce uh, two different polarizations. So uh, 
what we have done is that we determine the relation between relation between theta i, theta r, theta t. But uh, we didn't do anything about the direction of e i naught and e r naught and, and, and e t naught vector, right? And then there's too many degrees of freedom to solve. So uh, we divide the situation into two. One is called S polarization and the other is called P polarization. And S polarization means electric field is perpendicular to the plane of incidence. Okay, again, the plane of incidence is our screen. So perpendicular to plane of incidence means electric field is like this, right? It's like this, like this. And then P polarization means electric field is parallel to the plane of instance. Why we do this? Because uh, if we do it, it's much easier to solve. And second, uh, all the other cases can be written as a linear combination of these two, right? So uh, electric field normal to the plane, electric field perpendicular to the plane. And then if you, uh, if there can be case that uh, electric field is kind of uh, in the middle, then you can just solve for S polarization and P polarization and, and add their solutions then you can, you can obtain like uh, what's in the middle, right? So electric field always can be written as S wave and the P wave so that uh, we can just try to solve the situation, uh, the electric uh, magnetic problem for S wave and P wave separately and then add if we need it. Okay, so uh, this is pretty much all I want to say today. And what I uh, want to do uh, next there's, uh, next uh, Tuesday is to actually deal with uh, the S polarization and P polarization. Okay, how to solve, how to actually apply the boundary conditions to get the uh, reflected and transmitted wave solutions. And then, uh, and then once we do that, uh, we, we try to analyze the reflection and transmission properties for the, um, the oblique instance case, okay? And once we do it, uh, what we are gonna do uh, as a final step is multi-layer case, okay? It's not like, just one reflection, but we have like two interfaces and then we have like multiple uh, uh, reflection happen, like infinite reflection happen. And how can we deal with that case? And that concludes our uh, semester, okay? So, uh, yes, this is it for today. <laughs>